portion is called Breast Cancer, A Journey, because as many of you know, breast cancer is a journey. From the time she's diagnosed to through her surgery treatment, it's a, a process. So this is our patient. This is Jane. She is 65. She has been a good girl and went for her screening mammogram. And I'm going to present this as Jane. This is her journey. So I hope you'll take it with us. So as I said, Jane went for her screening mammogram, which you can see on the left. Um, pretty obvious there is a small lesion in her breast on the screening mammogram. So when that happens, oftentimes she'll be called back for what are called additional views. And depending on what the abnormality is, those views will either be compression or magnification. For a mask like this, we do uh, magnification views that get through uh, spot compression views. It gives us a better look at the lesion itself. You can see on the top right that when you add that compression, the speculations on this mask come out and become more obvious. And those are one of the things that alert us that this might be something that is uh, cancerous and needs more attention. Oftentimes, after the diagnostic mammogram is performed, the woman will have a diagnostic ultrasound done. The ultrasound is on the bottom right there. The lesion is taller than it is wide. It has speculated or rough borders. It has a halo or an area of sort of um, I don't know, glow around it, and then some blackness behind it, posterior shadowing. Those are all things that make us worry that this is a cancer. So when we see these things on imaging and they are concerning to us, we recommend a biopsy. Depending on if we're looking at calcifications that we're worried about or we're looking at a mass we may be worried about, this determines how we do the biopsy. This is sort of a simplification of what an ultrasound guided biopsy looks like. Um, you have you know, your breast is prepped and draped and sterile. You have the probe uh, right here. So under direct visualization, we see the mass we're going for. After all of your skin and underlying tissue is anesthetized, the needle would be advanced and samples will be taken. And these will be sent for evaluation to determine what this is. Image guided biopsy is the standard of care in this country. In 2005, an international multidisciplinary committee came together and determined that no longer was it acceptable to go to surgery first, do an open incision to take out tissue for a diagnosis. So as of 2005, this is our standard of care. If you know anyone or you yourself, if anyone recommends going to surgery first to diagnose your breast lesion, go somewhere else. This allows for planning, surgical planning. So we've done something minimally invasive. We have a diagnosis. Now I can plan your surgery from day one. It doesn't necessitate two separate surgeries and uh, uh, compromising potential pathology margins, whatnot. I can do it all in one. Up. So that's why we do image guided biopsies first. In order to know that I can go back to where we took the tissue from, I will, or the radiologist that does the biopsy, will put in a little titanium clip. You don't feel it, you don't see it, it doesn't cause any issues with airport, these are questions I get, metal detectors, anything like that, and I need to know where to go if something needs more attention. Jane, she had her ultrasound guided biopsy done. Unfortunately, it came back as a 1.5 centimeter invasive ductal carcinoma. It was estrogen and progesterone receptor positive and HER2 new negative. These are things that our medical oncologist will talk to you a little bit more about, but this is Jane. Uh, on her physical exam, I didn't feel any enlarged lymph nodes at all. So clinically, meaning when I do my exam, we look at the imaging, we look at the biopsy. Clinically, she's a very early stage, stage 1A. But as you probably know, here is a picture of a cartoon of the breast. These are the lobules that make the milk deliver it to the ducts, which then deliver it to the nipple for breastfeeding. If your cancer starts in the lobes, it is a lobular carcinoma. If it starts in your ducts, it's a ductal carcinoma. These are the two most frequent kinds of breast cancer, invasive ductal being the most common, 80%, lobular coming in at about 10 to 15, and other more rare types of breast cancer following up the last five. Surgically speaking, if you're an early stage, like Jane is, stage one, stage two, Surgery is your primary therapy for um, treating your cancer in the beginning. Okay. So what do we want to do? Do we want to perform a lumpectomy, meaning taking um, the tissue, the cancer, and the rib of normal tissue, or do we want to do a mastectomy? Large multi-center trials done many years ago were instrumental and pivotal in changing us from radical mastectomies 
to something much smaller lumpectomy. We know that the survival is equivalent if you add radiation therapy to your lumpectomy. It takes your risk of recurrence from about 40% down to eight, and it's probably even lower given, given our modern treatments. We know that the recurrence rates are fairly similar, 8% as I mentioned versus five. If you have a mastectomy, you still have a small risk of recurrence. It is not zero. Multiple factors go into making the decision of whether you're gonna have a lumpectomy or a mastectomy. The size of your tumor relative to the size of your breast is important. And are you a candidate for the radiation therapy that goes hand in hand with your lumpectomy? Breast conservation, also known as lumpectomy, is removing, like I said, the cancer, a rim of normal tissue. Here is what we're going for, removing the cancer in the middle, a rim of normal tissue, and then this brown line here being your margin. We want it all to be clear. We don't want to find any cancer cells approaching the edge or the margin because we know that the one thing that will make your risk of recurrence two times higher than it is normally is if we leave cancer cells at your margin. So that does happen 20% of the time, and we do need to go back and clear that margin. So for 20% of women, it does require another surgery. But it's much smaller than the first one, and um, it's important to do. We, as I mentioned, radiation is absolutely essential to decrease your risk of local recurrence. So if you choose lumpectomy, you need to be willing to accept the radiation that goes with it as well. This is how we start the surgical day. I can't feel your clip. Most of these tumors are small, in Jane's case, and I can't um, feel the lump either. So I need a, a guide. So the morning of surgery, you'll go to radiology. The skin would be numbed up. The, and under imaging, either mammogram or ultrasound, a small wire will be advanced to the clip. And that's what I'm going to use to guide me to plan my incision in the OR and decide what tissue I need to take based on this. And then in the operating room, after I do the lumpectomy, remove the, the clip area and the normal tissue around it, I send it to our radiology department to take a picture. They need to show me that what I'm going for is in the specimen, that the wire that uh, I was using to localize it is in the specimen, and that the margins around it look like I've got enough to be clear. So if you have a lumpectomy, as I mentioned, you know the tumor size to your breast size is important because ultimately the most important thing is curing your cancer, removing it all. But I need to leave you with a breast that looks like a breast. So if you're someone who's a smaller breast size and you have a tumor that's a little bit bigger um, and it's in the area on the top part of your chest where you don't have a lot of room to play, we can do things to fill in this hole so you don't have a defect. So that a year after radiation, you see down here, she looks wonderful. So this, this can be an option. We work closely with our plastic surgery colleagues to discuss which procedure we're gonna do, lumpectomy, mastectomy, and then how we're gonna make your breast look good at the end of it all. This is another patient. Uh, she has larger breasts, and she had a tumor in what we call the inferior pole of the breast, meaning underneath here. That area is not very forgiving for taking a lot of tissue if you're small breasted. So for her, she had enough that what, what we did was we took out the lumpectomy here, and then the plastic surgeons brought it together over here and gave her a lift, and then matched the other side. And at four years after radiation, she looks fantastic. Mastectomy. If your tumor is too large to accommodate, and I can't even use the, the techniques that I showed you previously, mastectomy is uh, what we would recommend to treat your cancer effectively and also to leave you with a reconstructed breast that looks better than anything that we could give you if we did a lumpectomy. If you have tumors in more than one quadrant of your breast, we would recommend mastectomy. If you just feel like, I don't want to do lumpectomy, I don't want to do radiation, I don't want to maybe go back for positive margins, I want a mastectomy, that's okay too. Whatever you choose is right for you, and you you're the one that lives with it, your family, your activities of daily living, all of this stuff has to be what's right for you. The most common mastectomy that we do is called the skin sparing mastectomy, where we remove the breast tissue, the nipple areolar complex, but we leave the majority of your skin envelope intact so that our plastic surgery colleagues can make a new breast for you. Whether they do that with implants, removing your own tissue from your tummy or somewhere else to build you a new breast, it leaves them the skin to do that with. We use different incisions, as you can see, based on what the reconstructive plan is with your plastic surgeon. So we get together the day before or the morning of surgery. We draw on patients, and, and that's kind of the guide that we use to decide what incisions we're going to use. The second kind of mastectomy is what's called a nipple sparing mastectomy. It's very popular uh, in the press. Angelina Jolie, as we all know, had it done for her BRCA1 positive status. 
Uh, we get a lot of questions about nipple sparing, and there's no doubt if you're the right candidate, it leaves you with this beautiful cosmetic result. We do use uh, and have strict criteria, though, because like I said, the main goal is to get rid of your cancer. So if you have a very large cancer, if you have a cancer that's too close to your nipple, if you have uh, cancer in multiple areas of your breast, it increases your risk of having a recurrence, and this is probably not the best option for you. Or if your breast is too large and your nipple is what we call totic or pointed you know, downward and we can't fill enough of your skin envelope to give you a good looking cosmetic result after your cancer is treated, then it's not a good option either. But if you are a good candidate and it's something that you want, we will remove your breast tissue but leave your entire skin envelope, including your nipple and areolar complex, intact. And again, our plastic surgery colleagues will help you decide how you want to fill that in to reconstruct your breast. So after we address the breast, we also, as part of the cancer surgery, have to address your axilla, the lymph nodes. We need to determine if you have any lymph node involvement because that goes into determining your stage of your breast cancer, your final stage. So for Jane, you know, she, she didn't have any lymph nodes that we could feel in her axilla. So what we recommended to her is what's called a <coughs> sentinel lymph node biopsy. It is a procedure where we inject a couple different dyes and then we look at the first one or two lymph nodes that are draining your breast to determine if there's any cancer cells in them. And if there are, then we go forward with some different things, but we need to at least evaluate them to get a complete idea of your staging. And this is kind of what I was talking about, the two tracer technique. We have one that's called technetium that makes a little clicking noise that I can pick up with a probe. And then we have the vital blue dye here that I can visually see. So we use both of these tracers, and then our goal is to find this lymph node here, which if you were gonna have cancer cells present in your lymph nodes, this is where we would find them. So this is the lymph node, and maybe one or two more that we're looking for. This is what it looks like in the operating room. You can see this um, blue kind of channel tracking this way, and this blue lymph node here that was also the one that made that tick 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 with our probe. So I know that this is my sentinel node, this is the one that I take out and send to the pathologist so they can look at it and let me know if there's any cancer cells in it. There's also this little guy here. He's gonna, because he's blue, he's gonna be sampled as well. You can have anywhere from one to four lymph nodes. Most women we take out two. After Jane went through her lumpectomy and her sentinel lymph node biopsy, her final pathology was, as we saw from an imaging standpoint, 1.5 centimeter invasive ductal carcinoma, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor positive, HER2 negative. We took two sentinel lymph nodes, they were both negative, and the margins of her resection were clear. So she had the ideal result and outcome. So pathologically speaking, meaning after we look at everything under the microscope, she's still stage 1A, which is very good news for her. So I will see her back in clinic after this, make her check her incision, make sure she's doing well, and then I will pass her forward to the colleagues on my team that will help also um, on the journey for the breast cancer treatment. And um, I will put in a referral to our radiation oncologist because as I mentioned, she had the lumpectomy. She needs the complement of the radiation therapy. And then she'll also see my colleague, Dr. Bella, so he can recommend any adjuvant therapies that may be of benefit to help her reach her cure. Um, breast cancer is a very common illness. Um, as you uh, may be all aware already, it's uh, as common as one every day woman will develop breast cancer in the lifetime. <laughs> so if you look around your uh, cells in um, this room, there's gonna be a great number of women that could potentially, hopefully not, uh, be diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, about 240,000 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in the US in 2014. Of those, about 40,000 will die. Uh, the number of new uh, breast cancer cases continues to go up, and I think, uh, or we think, it's because we um, are more aware of it. These uh, sessions bring more awareness to you. Uh, women go for the mammogram, and we're able to find them um, more than what we used to do before. In Florida, there's going to be about 12,500 cases that are going to be diagnosed uh, this year, and of those, about 2,500 women will die from the disease. Uh, breast cancer also happens in men, but the ratio is for every 100 women will have one man that will develop breast cancer. Um, those are the statistics. So as you, as you see, it's very, very, very common. 40,000 women dying every year is a lot of women dying from this disease. And, and um, it's very likely that you will find somebody that you know, whether it's your friend, hopefully uh, not your family member, that will have the disease. We want to bring you awareness of what's available in memorial for, for those patients. So 
chemotherapy is still part of the backbone for tumor breast cancer, usually when it's more um, advanced, um, usually starting at stage two and above. Um, chemotherapy can give you before or after the surgery. The idea today, the paradigm is shifting and more patients are getting chemotherapy before surgery because we have been able to identify drugs that work better. And by working better, we have a good chance of maybe sending you to surgery with no tumor found at the time of the surgery. You come in with a lump and then you go to surgery and there's nothing, it's just like magic happening, but it's not it's the chemotherapy that did the trick. We have very good chemotherapies for patients that have triple negative disease, which was a uh, disease that's very aggressive, relentless, uh, and to respond very poorly before, but we now have some um, uh, protocols that we can get you to surgery with a 50, maybe more than 50, 50 chance of having no tumor at the time of the surgery. The other group of diseases is called the HER2 positive disease, which we have a, a, a group of different different uh, treatment protocols in which we have a chance close to eight, uh, seven to eight out of 10 times uh, chance of getting into surgery with no disease at the time of the surgery. There is risk factors for development of breast cancer, things that you can and you cannot modify, things that you cannot modify is your age, as older you get, the more chance you have of developing breast cancer. The median age is about 65 years old, but here, at Memorial, we have women that are in their 20s, women that are in their 90s, so we see a broad array of uh, uh, different age groups. Race and ethnicity, depending on where your background is, you may have um, a genetic predisposition that makes you more prone. Your uh, ethnicity can make you more prone to have different type of breast cancer compared to the other, with a woman, um, African-American woman having a more um, or a higher predisposition to develop triple negative breast cancer, which is an aggressive type of breast cancer. Um, if you have had benign breast disease, multiple biopsies of your breast, that also increases your risk. Um, if you have breast cancer, you're gonna have a higher chance of having a second breast cancer, just above the average population. Lifestyle, um, dietary factors, if you eat a lot of uh, stuff that you're not supposed to eat. Um, you develop prediabetes, um, that's a risk factor for developing breast cancer. Uh, sedentary lifestyle, not exercising is also not good. Um, reproductive and hormonal factors means that the less kids you have, the more propensity you have to developing breast cancer uh, because you're uh, being stimulated by estrogen throughout your whole reproductive age without no break. So you need that break. Um, the younger you have your first kid, the less chance of breast cancer you have. Um, the breastfeeding also is linked to decreasing the risk of breast cancer. Family history, self-explanatory, you have mom, uh, grand grandma, auntie, everybody have breast cancer. Even if you don't have a genetic predisposition, there's a good chance that you may develop breast cancer. Radiation that goes more with patients that have uh, uh, diseases like Hodgkin's disease that requires radiation when they're young to the breast. Uh, they need to be monitored very, very carefully because they have an increased risk for de developing breast cancer. Environmental factor, there's a lot of uh, population studies that links um, uh, tobacco, um, cigarette smoking, um, hydrocarbon smoke, and things of that nature to uh, development of breast cancer. Symptoms, anything new, different in your breast, uh, doesn't really resolve quickly, it's most likely uh, not good, so you have to bring it to the attention of the GYN doctor, your primary care doctor, any new long mass, any uh, change in the skin color, any changes in your nipple, any redness. It's um, also in your axilla, your axilla is basically under your armpit. You have to be cognizant that uh, any changes that um, are new, that are worrisome, that don't go away, you have to bring it to the attention. What do you have to do uh, for screening? Just there's a lot of confusion out there. Some people say start age 50, some people start age 40, every two years, forget about all those things. I think it's just easy to go with the more um, uh, vast recommendation is to do your yearly screen starting at age 40, once a year, and from there on. Um, when do you stop is a good question. Some guidelines say stop at 75, but some women are 75 and they still have uh, 15 to 20 years left on them, so just keep um, screening until your life expectancy is expected to be less than five years, which is sort of hard to tell. So these are the different stages of breast cancer, one, two, three, and four. Um, 
one to three are potentially curable, four is not curable, but we can treat it as a chronic illness, like we treat hypertension, diabetes, uh, we have a lot of treatments, and we have women living 15 years and more with uh, stage four breast cancer these days. So don't think uh, that if somebody you know or somebody you see here in the hospital, they come in with stage four breast cancer, it's just their last, uh, their last uh, hospital stay and give up hope, just get us involved as early as you can. Uh, prognostic indicators, uh, tumor size, like we look, determine stage, um, at the moment of axillary lymph nodes also involved, uh, determine stage. Gray, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, HER2 new and KI67, all those things are things that the pathology reports to us and we interpret and we see um, how aggressive or, or what's the signature of the tumor and, and what the chance of the tumor um, has from coming back. So we talked about surgery, chemo, radiation, hormones, biological therapy, and we have clinical trials, which we think is the, the most important uh, part. Uh, here at Memorial, we have a, a good research infrastructure. We have a lot of uh, clinical trials for different types of cancer. For breast cancer right now, we have, um, I would say, around 20, and we have five opening um, this month. Chemotherapy, I talked about before, after the surgery, I like give chemo a lot before the surgery. If you have a tumor that's larger than two centimeters with any adverse prognostic features, come to us um, after you see the surgeon because we'd like to give you chemotherapy to try to shrink and hopefully disappear the tumor. There is some studies that say that if you get to surgery with no cancer, your chances of the cancer coming back and leaving um, are greater. Uh, more studies need to be done to confirm that, but um, it is, uh, it's a good survey point. Adjuvant, if you already had your surgery because you had a small tumor, then we decide whether you really need chemo or not. And in metastatic setting, again, we have chemo, we have um, uh, other options. This is a test that's been widely available now for about eight, maybe nine years, I would say. Um, it's called the Oncotype DX, where we look at the genes of your tumor and we make the decision whether chemotherapy is going to be of benefit to you if you have an early tumor with no significant lymph node involvement. This looks at 21 genes within the tumor that was taken out of the surgery, was sent to pathology, we send it to them, and then they do a mathematical algorithm and give us a number between 0 to 100. The closer to 0, the less benefit you have from chemo the higher uh, you go, the, the more um, chances that your tumor will come back and the more benefit you will derive from chemo. So we're not just making decisions based on the size of the tumor, how the tumor looks, how you look, but also to the genes um, of the tumor. Um, and that's something we do at Memorial very routinely. Um, hormonal therapy, we have different options. I'm not gonna go into any detail, but it's usually a pill that you take from five to 10 years after, after your surgery. We have data from December and a meeting that happened in San Antonio every year that we know that tamoxifen for 10 years is better than five years in women that are young with the diagnosis of breast cancer. Biological therapy is a little bit more exciting because chemo and hormonal therapy, they've been around for about 30 years. Um, these targeted therapies, they became uh, more popular for the last 10 um, years, give or take. Um, we have therapies that target that little uh, HER2 new antenna that you see in the surface of the cell. That's just basically an antenna that's capturing a signal that's making them grow um, uncontrollably. So we, uh, uh, well, people up in California, lead, led by somebody that we work very closely, uh, developed this compound and uh, basically were able to block that signal and change the paradigm of the treatment of a very aggressive type of breast cancer that we had no really good treatments for before 2005, give or take. We have, uh, in that same uh, run, we have four three, or three more drugs that were approved, lapatinib, pertuzumab, TDM1, they're all available at Memorial. And not only those, but we have other drugs that are newer. Uh, there's a new compound called neratinib. We have a clinical trial that's targeting that particular uh, receptor, giving it to women that have basically failed these therapies. Uh, we have a vaccine study that's looking, or it's opening, that's looking at women with high risk her to know that after we did all that, they still had some residual tumor at the time of the surgery. We're gonna give them a vaccine after we finish all the chemo to try to make sure the cancer doesn't come back. Um, 
that uh, drug called Embrolimus is an allergic medication that targets a different receptor that's usually inside the cell. It's, it's a pathway inside the cell, it's not outside. And we have studies with these new compounds here at Memorial that help a different subset of cancer patients by basically blocking the phase of cell division, arresting the cell so they don't keep going in the cell cycle. Um, and PARP inhibitors is for women that were um, um, diagnosed with a genetic mutation, BRCA1 or BRCA2, like Angelina Jolie. If she ever gets cancer, eventually she may benefit from one of these drugs, which for which we have a couple studies here at Memorial. And we work very closely with a uh, group at the UCLA. Uh, we were just in a meeting there, and we basically collaborate. They send the studies. We enroll patients and we share science with them. Uh, there's a group here in the Northeast, um, there's Sarah Cannon, uh, the NCI, and work with different pharmaceutical companies that have interesting compounds and want to bring them to the community. These are the studies we have opened now, but that's just a limited list. Uh, there's more that are opening um, as we speak, pretty much. Um, so I think it's an important point knowing that you don't have to go to, I would say, University of Miami to UCLA, you don't even have to go to MD Anderson or Memorial Sloan Kettering. I think you have good access to standard therapy drugs, whether you have insurance, whether you don't have insurance, we'll treat you exactly the same. Um, and then we can also give you the opportunity to be on cutting edge therapies that you will otherwise have um, nowhere else um, outside of Memorial. Memorial not only focuses their efforts in research, but also in all the supportive services that go with um, treatment of breast cancer, including image recovery, acupuncture, massage therapies, uh, psychotherapy. Um, so you have pretty much everything you need here, and probably more than you need, um, and more than what's available in all the places I've been, I've been in the past. So. Hopefully you want, or nobody you know, uh, will be diagnosed with breast cancer, but if it does, we'll be happy to take care of them. We'll provide them with everything they need to get over that hump in their life. This is the new center. It's gonna be very, very um, nice and modern, um, and it's gonna be opening December or January. We will have the surgeon, you'll have the medical oncologist, you have the geneticist, you have pretty much everybody under the same roof. So these are the conclusions in general. It's just that breast cancer is not just one disease where people get treated uh, all the same. We um, are no longer chemotherapy doctors. We basically become um, doctors have to understand molecular biology, uh, genetics, to be able to tailor your treatment better. Um, cancer, a uh, cancer field is evolving at the same rate. Doctors have to evolve uh, to understand uh, how to treat you better. We have about 8,000 patients here in the breast cancer center. We have a high risk department where we have about 1,500 women that don't have breast cancer, but there are high risk than the average woman out there that we follow very closely to make sure that if they develop it, we'll catch it very, very early and we can have them live um, a normal life. The Fab Five, and that's it. Just, uh, I came up with the word synergy because I think, you know, it sounds pretty cool and it also means that we're better than each individual facet of the treatment team when we put ourselves together. Um, again, I'm putting up the numbers here, but I think uh, uh, 2014 numbers, I think, you know, the impact in Florida is here and I think uh, uh, we are able to help patients as Dr. Velez and the other physicians are gonna tell us, you know, with state-of-the-art care. Uh, and I just wanted to point out, you know, the impact of uh, loss of life. Breast cancer uh, comprises 14% of uh, uh, cases of uh, cancer in the United States, and 7% uh, of the deaths are due to breast cancer. Uh, and I just want to mention the survivorship aspect, uh, you know, as a uh, positive point in the beginning, because women with breast cancer who have beat it as well as who are, you know, dealing with it as a chronic illness. Uh, comprise two and a half million uh, residents in the United States. So this is the multidisciplinary approach, and I, I wanted to point out that there are specific facets to each that you know create an integral part of uh, assessing, evaluating, taking care, and following the patient. And I wanted to kind of show how radiation is impacted by each one of these facets. So history of radiation, you know, is over a century old, and uh, uh, we can thank a very prominent woman in uh, 
applying radiation to helping treat cancer. It seems like women and breast cancer still dominate the press back then because you can see one of the earliest applications of the pictures I could find was a woman receiving radiation for breast cancer. And you know, at the turn of the century, you know, the techniques have obviously become more refined, but the concept of treating cancer uh, without removing the breast uh, you know, was around for a while. Okay. Why does radiation work? And I think I kind of summarize it by saying we rely on the fact that normal tissue, normal cells heal. Cancer cells can't heal so well. So preferentially, we're able to deliver something that you know, damages DNA and have the cancer not heal and the, uh, the person heal around, uh, heal after the cancer treatment. And I also want to point out here, this is kind of why we describe, uh, you know, kind of a strict adherence not to overdo antioxidants. Uh, in the lab anyway, we understand that antioxidants scarf up free radicals and, uh, you know, that's kind of the premise when, in advertising why you know, free radicals are bad for you, we want to use antioxidants to stop aging, etc. But uh, they only last for like a millionth of a second anyway, free radicals. Uh, so we don't want free radicals used up because we're using them to kill cancer. So that's the principle of why we ask someone, you know, why don't you stop your high doses of antioxidants and supplements during radiation, probably you know, during chemotherapy as well. So the concepts of radiation really, and the applications are uh, whether we're treating the whole breast, part of it, or are we treating after uh, surgery, and are we trying to offer quality of life, and we're mentioning uh, palliation in that uh, situation. The concept of uh, radiation has been uh, whole breast for anywhere between four to six and a half weeks, twice daily radiation for five days is partial breast radiation. And after mastectomy, you know, the question often comes up, well, I've had the breast removed, uh, why do I need the same duration of radiation that I would have had to take if I had my breast intact? Again, the, the doses described for radiation have really been for microscopic disease. Uh, you know, it's infrequent that we're offering radiation for a cancer that's in place. Maybe prostate cancer is another one example, a brain tumor you can't cut out. Uh, but that said, most of the time we're supplementing or offering adjuvant radiation and the doses to sterilize microscopic disease uh, has been you know, tested and uh, we recognize it's probably a five to six and a half week course to do that. And for a quality of life, for pain relief, for you know, help with bleeding or address uh, a skin wound that's not healing, radiation for palliation is important. Definitive radiation is very often used for stage zero, one or two, stage zero being the DCIS. Uh, uh, and partial whole breast and we, then we have discussion about when we're going to treat lymph nodes. I'll mention that in just a second. So, and after mastectomy, why would we treat radiation? Because we think the microscopic disease is either in any of these uh, uh, anatomic locations. And, you know, in select cases, we're also offering it to women who have been documented with metastatic disease because local failure or, or cancer coming back locally can be uh, very troubling, painful, bleeding, uh, and uh, we often, you know, we consider it there as well. And for quality of life, for palliation, you know, I think with uh, uh, HER2 cancers, uh, HER2 positive cancers specifically, cancer coming back in the brain is uh, a slightly more high, a higher chance of that. So we want to optimize local control in the brain. Uh, palliation for pain or, you know, skin we mentioned. But even as we make breast cancer a chronic illness, Eradicating a small spot that's residual that you know kind of remains after a long line of therapy, we can eradicate it with precision radiation at times, including CyberKnife, and we call it oligo or few metastases. And it's not a foreign concept anymore. Where in uh, many cancers and breast cancer in particular, where there are many systemic you know, whole body treatment options, that we want to eradicate a small spot of residual cancer, even if it is to give them a, a holiday from drugs treatment. So going through the approaches, uh, you know, I bring up the concept of multidisciplinary because I think we've got to look at the whole patient. We don't want to stop at a small spot and, you know, act upon that. And I think if we're all together and acting, you know, in unison, and up, you know, in a prospective fashion, I think it really helps. So the imaging aspect, you know, in our department, we're kind of obliged to, uh, 
review imaging on a regular basis, and you know, it starts from not only what the patient had, has, has had done, but we use our planning CT to actually do all our aiming and treatment. And our planning CT, CT scan for uh, simulation, uh, you know, that again, a very common question is, I just had a scan, why do I need to have another scan? But this literally has the patient in the actual treatment position. You know, we do have some uh, uh, coordinating uh, system where we're able to uh, use our specific CT scan with our linear accelerators, so hence the need for that CT scan before starting. Uh, PET CT has made a big difference, especially in locally advanced breast cancer patients, uh, where we can identify lymph nodes and where we can target, you know, specifically where the doses of radiation need to go. And you can see, you know, we're, we're talking about the heart and the left breast and obviously the lungs, so we want to minimize doses as much as we can. This is kind of uh, a picture that describes our treatment planning, and we, we can kind of see where the dose is bathed over the chest wall in the post mastectomy setting, but we're trying to treat lymph nodes as well. And on a, a coronal or a straightforward look, you're trying, you have a picture of where we're actually trying to paint the dose. Again, we need to know anatomy, and uh, we kind of have uh, clinical examining the patient as well as putting together with the CT. Uh, this, these are pictures we show our patients as well to try to help them understand how much or how little of their body we're going to give radiation to. So the surgical oncology aspect was very eloquently discussed, and I think uh, the surgery really dictates what we're going to do and we need, what we need to consider. So when we've had breast conserving surgery, you know, we're contemplating treatment of, you know, where the lump used to be, or lumpectomy as we uh, sometimes call it, and then the entire breast. And there is a randomized trial that shows that if you give additional dose to that area, there's actually an incremental 3-4% survival benefit. That's why we're often treating the whole breast to a certain volume and where the lump used to be for the last week or so. Partial breast radiation, we've talked about whole breast. You know, partial breast radiation probably has been around for uh, 100 years, but uh, we, are, we do it a lot more elegantly now. Uh, and it, we need to offer treatments for whom it is appropriate. So we want to select patients probably with some guidance of age. Now, not being ageist, but perhaps the behavior of cancer is different over age. Uh, tumor size, certainly negative margins. You know, uh, some ductal carcinoma patients are you know, appropriately treated with partial breast radiation. And, you know, lymph nodes should be negative, although people are trying to expand that, and our current trial allows patients with one lymph node positive. And what we're trying to do is treat less than the breast, so it's what was taken out plus about uh, four fifths of an inch around it. The smaller volume allows us to give a much, much higher dose, actually twice a day, and it's a shorter treatment time. Uh, we try to do this with outside external beam radiation, and in, invariably, I think we end up treating uh, more than a third of the breast, which we don't like to do with big doses. So we're often relying on brachytherapy, which, you know, from the Greek means bracky short distance, the concept of putting radiation right where you want to give the dose instead of having it come from the outside and go in. And again, Marie Curie, I mean, for radium, uh, that's where we gain the concept of putting radiation right inside. The delivery of radiation, you know, it's low dose rate, high dose rate, this is what we do uh, use here, and it's a shorter treatment time, less than 10 minutes. Uh, historic, again, pictures where we don't want to necessarily have 15 catheters implanted via needles. And again, this is, we have done this, but not here, and I've done this before, but we prefer not to do this unless we have to. Uh, we have delivery devices now where catheters have been uh, available probably since 2002 now, uh, starting with a balloon catheter, then modification of the balloon catheter, and you know, strut catheter that we kind of preferentially use here, these two. Concept again, you know where the lump used to be. You're artificially keeping that open, help, you know, keeping it from healing and collapsing upon itself. And you're placing a catheter in place and delivering radiation probably to this air, uh, area of volume, I'm sorry, and about two centimeters around it to uh, sterilize the area. And again, we're using historic data that said, uh, you know, from the 50s uh, that said that God forbid cancer came back, it came back roughly within an inch of where it used to be. And that premise we're trying to take advantage of in treating just part of the breast. 
So again, ultrasound assessment, placement of the catheter, and again, this was 2002 that the first device, Mammocyte, was approved, uh, you know, and it delivers a volume of radiation, as you can see. So the skin, on a CT scan, the skin and the chest wall were, you know, critical structures where we didn't want to give big doses too fast. Because early on, there were areas where the skin would open or necrose or, you know, peel. Interoperative radiation, I just mentioned it because it's in the press, Holy Cross has it. The concept of doing this, honestly, was born out in Europe where access was not there. And you wanted to have the ability to cut out the cancer and put something, and give the treatment immediately, and actually in one treatment. But there, you know, you're looking for the margins, you don't know them right away. And a positive margin often meant the patient needed additional treatment. And the concept here was also uh, outside the United States, usually about one quarter of the breast is removed in a partial mastectomy. That's not the case here, and I don't think you have to do that, but the volume of breast tissue removed and the fact that you know this is done uh, afterwards, I think, gave rise to the uh, fact that you can do this for everyone and everywhere. Um, as I called around you know, to leaders around the country, they kind of agreed with my statement. This is, there was not a problem that we needed to fix with this technology, but this technology is you know, just up the road. Uh, this is one of the catheters we use, the savvy catheter, and this kind of sh shows you in cartoon form where it is inside the patient deployed, and the radiation doses. We often describe our doses with these isodose lines. So again, we have so much technology. I think we're obliged having the technology to apply it appropriately and ethically. And you know that's kind of the reason I bring, bring up the intraoperative radiation as well as proton ring radiation, which because it's out there, people want to try using it for breast cancer now. So. You know, we may hear about that in the press as well. So after mastectomy, uh, you know, historically we said you had to do something more because the risk of something coming back was too high. If there were four or more lymph nodes positive, you had a big primary tumor, and you know, unfortunately, if you had a positive margin, yes, we can keep cancer from coming back. Newer data. So there's a whole host of factors. Now I'll show some slides that I'll skip through, but. The contemporary data shows that if any lymph node was soiled and age, and if there was any lymphovascular invasion or grade, or even a combination of factors, there was a high enough risk that there was a recurrence. And this was studied in women who did not have radiation. <laughs> so basically, the two things we're able to say is not only control, but survival benefits. So these were the, all the, uh, potential benefits of post mastectomy radiation. Women have been convinced that they can choose uh, bilateral mastectomy, and this really shows the rates increasing of uh, uh, bilateral mastectomy uh, over time. And it impacts how we're treating patients. So uh, expander in place uh, is usually what we see before uh, when the patient comes, not with the implant in place. And we have some Concerns as we're treating a uh, chest wall, we're able to do it very easily, if you will. But with a reconstructed chest wall, we're often trying to aim precisely, trying to minimize dose for the heart and lungs.